Okay. Right. So when you're good to go, Chris. Just start. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Chris George. Um, I've got 30 minutes to talk about quite a lot of stuff. So I'm probably going to talk quite fast. If you have any questions, please do ask, unless you're watching this after the fact, but you can't ask any questions, but <laughs> there you go. Um, so I've got three ciders. I've got three cheeses. I work for a company called, uh, currently work for a company called the Trithowan Brothers, who are based in North Somerset, about five miles from Cheddar. <clears throat> um, the two brothers, Morgan and Todd, have been cheesemakers now for 25, 26 years, something like that. I met Todd first at Neil's Yard Dairy in the mid-90s when I worked there. Uh, he went off to make cheese not long after that. And the cheese he went to make was a kefili. I've got a cheese board here. And I've got, I've got to say, this, they didn't scrimp on the samples for me. There you've got some quite massive samples of cheese there. Um, we have Go With Kefili here, made by the Trithan Brothers. We have Pitchfork Cheddar here, made by the Trithan Brothers. And in the back here, we have another cheese. It's a blue cheese. It's made by a guy called uh, Josh Snyder uh, um, in Nottinghamshire. It's Stitchelton. I'll talk more about these, obviously, as we go on. But those are the three cheeses we're going to discuss. I'm going to do it with three ciders. So I've worked in cheese for 27 years, but several years ago, I got interested in cider. And um, started my own small business, Colton Crown, about three years ago. And I've selected three cheeses, uh, three ciders, pardon me, which I think will go really well with three cheeses. Now, they're quite different. I had so many things to choose from. So it was a... Uh, it, it was, I just want to get three cheeses, three ciders from three very different producers, which were very different in style. So the three that we have are, I have them up here. The first one we're going to try, I'm going to do this with a go with, is the Pilton cider, which is made in Shepton Mallet by a guy called Martin Berkeley. I'll talk about these in more detail as we go along. Second one is called Stockmore Farm by Ross and Y. So Stockmore Farm, it is a single varietal. I think it's Yellington Mill. Could be wrong, but I think it's Yellington Hill, it's a varietal. Um, this has been aged in a whiskey cask. These guys are in Herefordshire, just outside of Ross and White, and a place called Peter's Store. And the final one, which is a bit more special and a bit more unusual, is uh, Somerset Ice Cider, made at Borough Hill by Julian Templey. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to pair that with the blue cheese. So, first things first, let's talk about the cheeses. So, um, I actually think cider and cheese go together fantastically well. I think the problem we have in this country is most people, but certainly of my generation and people I've talked to who are younger than me as well, have an experience of cider when they're teenagers or when they're at university and they drink something which is very poor quality, don't feel very well afterwards and they never want to touch it again. I had that experience as so did all of my friends. And it wasn't until about eight or nine years ago I was actually working in New York selling beer, but they also sold cider and I started to try it and I had a, an epiphany. I thought, actually, my idea of cider was completely wrong. It was completely formed by mass-produced industrial ciders. And in fact, in this country, and it's a burgeoning thing now, there are small producers making fantastic cider from 100% yeast, which is an important thing to note, using wild yeast, which is an important thing to note, and uh, from apple, from fresh apples, which they're pressing themselves. It's basically a vintage, is winemaking. I think cider gets lumped in with beer a lot. I think it's kind of a blue collar product. So people associate it with beer, but in fact, it has much more to do with wine than it does with beer. It is in fact winemaking, it is pressing apples. And if you're making perry, which we're not gonna talk about today, which is another topic altogether, pressing pears, as you're picking them at this time of year, in fact, we're now in October, um, letting them uh, age, ferment with wild yeast through the winter and then you're bottling them or whatever in the spring and going into the summer so anyway let's talk about this cheese because this is the cheese academy after all so this cheese here is called uh uh go with kefili this is the cheese that martin chathawan left neil's Yard dairy to go with to learn how to make now at the time there was only one cheese maker i think in the world making an unpasteurized natural rinded Caffili by hand. That gentleman was called Chris Duckett, and I had the privilege of uh, going and making cheese with Chris Duckett myself in the late 90s, and actually patting butter with his mother in the garage out the back, which is a pretty amazing thing to be able to do. Um, changed my view of butter entirely. That's a completely different topic. Um, and so uh, Martin went and lived, Todd's pardon me, went and lived on the farm in a caravan for about six months, and he learned to make 
Kefili from Chris Duckett. Now, Chris Duckett's cheese, Duckett's Kefili, is still made, but it's actually made by another cheddar maker, Westcom Cheddar, which is one of the three cheddar makers, Pitchfork, Westcom, Montgomery's, the three traditional cloth bag cheddars, unpasteurized cloth bag cheddars that are now in existence. So, um, Westcom Cheddar, Tom Calver, took over the production of uh, Chris Duckett's cheese, Duckett's Kefili, when Chris passed away. So they know there's, there's still two cheeses being made, this one and the Duggars Kefili. So what are we looking at when we look at a cheese like this? Well, one thing to notice is, I mean, the rind's pretty obvious. It's got a really interesting, let me get that in front of the screen. There we go. Interesting rind. This is a natural rind. This is something you, you really don't see on, um, on Kefili very much anymore. Most Kefilis, along with most Cheshire's, Wensdale's, Lancashire's, et cetera, these territorial British cheeses, as in they come from a certain place. And what we call crumbly is actually quite acid, quite tangy, quite crumbly. They're made in very large factories and they're quite generic and they come in vacuum packing. They don't have these natural rinds. Um, they're um, uh, pasteurized, they are quite acid. They're using um, starter cultures to produce acidity very quickly, which can be very sort of tart acid cheese and quite a dry, friable cheese as well, uh, with limited low in moisture. I know somebody who went to a factory to test. Um, Caffillies and Lancashire's and Cheshire's. And what they did was they made the cheese, then they took a cheese iron, which is the thing that you take a core sample with, then they went along the cheeses afterwards and decided what they were. So they taste it and go, mm, that's a Wednesday deal, mm, that's a Cheshire, which is kind of a bit back backwards because all these cheeses do actually have distinct personalities. But in the factory, that didn't really exist. So something like this, which is handmade and pasteurized with a, with a natural rind, it's got a lot more character. Not only has it got a not, lot more character, it's got a lot. It's, it's almost like geological. You've got like a layer of, of, of rind, which has a flavor and it can be eaten. I always eat the rind. Natural rinds can be delicious. Um, sometimes they're not, but if you don't try them, you don't know. And actually from batch to batch, from cheese to cheese, the rind can change a lot. So even the same cheese in a different batch, you might enjoy the rind of one cheese, but not on the other. So it's always worth trying the rind. And also cheese is sold by weight. You've paid for the rind, you may as well eat it. Yeah, give it a go. I think the rind is delicious, particularly a healthy natural rind like this. Then just under the rind, I don't even really see it actually on this quality video, but it's a little bit softer. That rind is breaking the cheese down. So that gives you a different flavor to what's in the middle. So what's in the middle is actually quite acid. What's under the rind, where the rind's breaking it down, is actually less acid and you start to get more flavor compounds as well. So you get three textures and flavors from the middle, the outside and the rind. Okay, so I actually paired this with a cider which is actually kind of French influenced, if you like. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, it's the Pilsen, um, this one here. So this is keeved. Um, it has some residual sugar. So if you're keeving, pretty much all French cider is keeved. I mean, not all of it, but the majority. So they don't even put it on the bottle. It's just the way they make cider. So what is the keeving process? It's a very old process. I mean, I assume somebody discovered it by accident as most great ideas seem to come around by accident. Um, it's a fining process. If you leave, the juice the sit, sometimes what will happen is the pectinase in there will react with salts in there and it will form a gel. And as it starts to ferment, the bubbles will rise up through the liquid, taking out yeast and yeast nutrients and forming what's called the uh, Chateau Brun, the brown cap on the top. And because you find out yeast and yeast nutrients, the, the yeast aren't able to fully ferment the sugars in the juice that you then take off. So what you have is residual sugar left from the apple in the cider. So it's not sweetened. It's just you've taken out what the yeast need in order to ferment the cider. So if you have French cider from like Normandy and Brittany, all keyed, all will have some natural residual sugar. And uh, actually Martin Berkeley, who makes this, his wife's French, which is how he got into it. And that's why he's keeving, because he's making it in the French style, because that's what his, his wife introduced him to in terms of cider, cider making, if you like. The other thing you might notice about this, it's quite dark in color, let me see that. I've got something over here. Um, we're not gonna try this, but if you look at the, these two ciders, it's quite different in color, yeah? So. This one is actually made from eating apples. Uh, it's actually made from um, Egremont Russet, in fact, single variety. But if you see the difference in color, in the eastern part of the country, so Kent, Suffolk, Suffolk, et cetera, they tend to use eating apples because that's what they were growing for London. And actually more cider that people drink commercially, that it's made from eating apples. And actually most of it's made from concentrates, made from eating apples, and a lot of it's imported from abroad. Um, so if you see something like this, this sort of color, you're probably looking at something that's made with traditional cider apples. Now, a cider apple has got more tannin, more um, acidity. It's got more sugar as well. It's actually more fibrous as well. So it's not as nice to eat, but it's much better to press. It's almost spongy. Um, so if you're looking at something which is dark in color, you're probably looking at something that's made from proper cider apples. There are four sorts, sharps, 
bitters, sorry, sharp, bitter sharp, bitter sweet and sweet. The bitter refers to the tannin and it's the tannin that oxidizes and gives side ripples this color. So if you see some of this color, it's probably got some tannin in it. And tannin is the stuff that, if you have like a red wine, for example, makes your teeth squeaky. So it kind of makes you almost like a goldfish. I've got like dried mouth. And also sometimes you get leatheriness in the back. Soft tannin on the front gives you astringency. Hard tannin on the back gives you like a leatheriness. Now, when you're pairing with cheese, that's quite important because actually fats in cheese go really well with tannins because the fats kind of oil the tannins, etc. So they make, they make some really good bedfellows. I'm just going to take this cork out. It's actually going to pop up. Right? That's a nice noise. There you go. Smoking gun. You can see that's a, that's a nice sparkling side. I think this is pet nat. So bottled before the end of fermentation to give you um, a natural sparkle in the bottle. Pour it out. It's a nice mix on that, as you can see. So yeah, this is um, something that we used to do in this country is Kiev, but we just gave up on it. Because it's a bit of a faff, it doesn't always work. Now you can buy keeving kits that guarantee that it works. But it used to mean just to believe it's nature. And it wouldn't necessarily work, so I think people do. Basically, in this country, what they tend to do these days is let it ferment to dry, and then uh, back sweeten it. But if you do it this way, you don't need to back sweeten it. You're naturally creating a sweet cider. So you've got this dark colour from the tannins. You've got the natural sugar from the apple. And you should have something which is not sweet, and it's interesting when people ask me for a sweet cider or a dry cider, if they've been drinking commercial cider, a sweet cider is probably going to be very, very sweet. If they ask me for a dry cider, if I give them a dry cider, like the next one we're going to try, this one, they'd freak out because this, this is a dry cider. There is no sugar in this. But most commercial ciders, even if they're dry, they usually have some, some sugar in them. So it's a kind of to guesstimate the palate on an individual to determine what they're actually after. So I give out a lot of samples to try and figure out what people want, what people mean by dry, sweet, etc. Because everyone can have a different palate for these things. So this is going to have some natural sweetness. Sugar and salt is a wonderful bedfellow. So actually, something with sugar in, with cheese, is a great thing. All cheese has salt. All cheese has salt. It's a natural. It's it's a necessary ingredient. If somebody says I want um, salt-free cheese, they're wrong. That thing about the customer always being right. It's not true, they're not always right. You do not want salt-free cheese. If you have salt-free cheese, you'll have something which is unstable. You'll have something which um, can do things you don't necessarily want it to do. Salt inhibits bacteria and so forth. And also it's very, very bland. I tried some cheese once. We, at Neil's Our Dairy, we used to do a walk around every, so every Monday and taste all the cheese that was in stock. So we got through all the material grubs. Um, it's not a bad job. And we try everything. And we were all standing around eating. It was a, it was a goat's cheese from, from Ireland, I think it was. We're all standing around eating this stuff. And I started eating it and thinking, what's wrong with it? I realized it didn't taste of anything. It literally had no flavor. We had something in our mouths. It was flavorless. They'd bought a new set of scales and they'd set it wrong. So they'd put in about 10% of the amount of salt that they normally do. There's almost no salt in it. It had zero flavor. Salt is a seasoning agent as well. If you make cheese without salt, it doesn't really taste of anything. It, so the, the salt not only helps um, preserve the food, it actually enhances the flavor as well. So it's fundamentally important. But salt and sugar are fantastic together, fantastic together. And when we get to the last cheese and the ice cider, that's when it's that's, that's demonstrated and it's most clear. So I'm going to try this. So if you're trying stuff like this, this I'm going to do this quick. I've actually put it in a wine glass. These are the best things to taste out of. Whatever you're tasting, something that's tapered like that, because you can stick your nose in it and the aromatics go up your nose rather than the side of your head. You can, you can actually swirl it. You can't see what I'm doing. Put it on a surface, swirl it. If you try and do that, you throw it all over yourself. It's much better to put it on a surface and do it. Swirl it around, get the aromatics in the glass. You stick your nose in and give it a smell. So that smells to me. You've got apple in there. You absolutely do, but it's like a sweet dessert apple. Sometimes on Kiev side, you get like a tartar tan character. I'm not getting that on this, but it does have the character of an apple that's been sauteed in butter and brown sugar. You know, that baked sugary sort of characteristic. There's a hint of acidity as well. This will be primarily bittersweet in this. So it's going to be low in acid, absolutely low in acid. That's the tradition with this style of cider. They're not usually very acid ciders. I'm going to try it. I slurp when I try. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. But it, it, if you oxygenate, like on your palate, it does make you taste better. I can't taste anything now without doing that. Coffee, water. I make right full of myself in public quite a lot by slurping just about everything I taste. But it does help you taste. It absolutely does. I've got a knife. I'm going to have some of this cheese. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut 
a cross section across. Because I want the rind to be under the rind and a bit in the middle. I want all of those sections because I'll have a different flavor, texture, and character. That's quite large. I might trim that. So, what I expect from this is a savouriness under the rind, a sort of a, a fresh acidity, lactic acidity in the middle. And at the edge, sometimes you get ammonia. Sometimes these rinds, it's, it's mucol and another mold, which I, with many, many syllables, and I've forgotten what it's called. But basically, it's a natural mold, and you can get like an earthiness from it. Sometimes you'll get, sometimes it makes me think of like a, a, an Oxfam shop full of mushrooms, kind of musty, mushroomy sort of character, but freshly tilled earth is a, is a smell. You get a lot of these things as well. But I expect to get a flavour and a texture off the rind and something else from the middle. So I'm going to eat this. I'm trying to eat it quick because obviously me sitting here eating isn't great viewing. So bright acidity. There's that earthy rind, which I love. And there is an earthiness to it. And there is like a mushroom character, a soil character. But the sugar in this, with the salt and the acidity, because salt, because acidity, sour and sugar, is also a great bedfellow. So this has got salt and sour, and the sugar in this, the sugar really well. And also this has got bubbles. And bubbles scrub fat from your tongue. So actually bubbles in, in drinks, but not too much. If something's too fizzy, it can air make you gassy. It can be mask flavor. It can actually be quite painful sometimes. And it masks the thing, it masks the thing that you're drinking and it just, it makes you not want to go back for more. So something like this, which I, I believe is pet nap, because it's a natural sparkle. It will have a finer mousse, so it won't be as big as the bubbles you get in say like a Coca-Cola, which is forced carbonate. The, the force the CO2 in under pressure, that's how they make it fizzy. You get a bit bigger bubble. With something like this with a, with a natural sparkle, it's a finer bubble, and it's much more pleasant to drink. Let me just test my theory. So it's a little bit of tannin, just a little bit. And actually, the tannin in that, with the fats in that, are really good. The sweet and sour, actually more than the salt, the acidity, the sourness in that, and this kefili, it's actually working really well with the sweetness in that. Um, these are very, very general rules, but I think, generally speaking, if you have something with, not too sweet necessarily, but something with sweetness, We'll go great with something with cheese, with, with, with most cheeses, particularly hard cheeses. Something with tannin will go great, usually, with hard cheeses. If you're looking at a very fresh cheese, like a goat's cheese, you probably want something lighter. Something with a big, bold, sort of tannic structure is going to smother it. It's like having a big red wine with a delicate goat's cheese. It's going to kill it. It's going to be too much. But things like goat's cheese is what I actually recommend people to drink. Perry, which is lighter, more delicate, it's made from pear. It's less imposing and actually complements the goat's cheese. Much better. Right. So, next cheese. So, the Trithan brothers went back to their family farm in Wales. Go with was the name of the farm. In fact, just you know how it's spelled. There you go. Go with. Um, that was the family farm. That's why the cheese is called Go with. And then, about seven years ago, eight years ago, they relocated to Somerset to build a new dairy next to a, a really good source of reliable milk. They, they didn't have as reliable a source of milk as they wanted. Uh, they wanted to basically build a dairy and have one source of milk milked by one sort of dairyman and have that close contact with the producer, which if you make an unpasteurized handmade cheese is really important. So they found a place in a village called Hewish, about five miles from Cheddar, um, and they built a dairy and they started making the go with on that site. Now they felt because they were now in Cheddar, they wanted to make something that was indigenous to that area. And cheddar is obviously the most famous cheese in Somerset, and obviously the cheese the most famously comes from cheddar. So this is a slice of their pitchfork cheddar, quite a big slice of their pitchfork cheddar. This is a cloth-bound cheese. Um, as I was saying, there's only three really cloth-bound cheeses coming out of Somerset at the moment, which are unpasteurized, handmade, uh, old-school starter, starter cultures. So the starter cultures, the lactic acid bacteria that create the acidity, which you need in order to coagulate you know, the cheese to make the style of cheese, basically, to coagulate the milk to make this uh, style of cheese. You can get them from a laboratory and they can like freeze dried ones. 
which is like SAS data cultures. You throw them in there, bang, they do the job. They give you a lot of acidity very quickly, which is great. And it's efficient. However, it doesn't give you quite the complexity of flavor. What they use for this cheddar, and, the Mon and Jamie Montgomery uses for his, and Tom Calver uses for the Westcom, is something called a pint starter. It's like a yogurt. It's a, a company called Barber's went around the country in the 1950s and found all the best starter cultures. And they're a big producer. They're like a factory producer, basically. But what they have is a library of these really old classic starter cultures. Um, so what you, it's called a pint starter because it literally comes in like a, a, a pint bottle, like a milk bottle. And what you'll do is you'll sterilize a churn of milk. You'll pour that into the milk. You'll leave it overnight to culture. And the next day, you'll pour that into your milk for making the cheese to begin, begin the acidification process. Um, it's a faff. And um, also, they're... Those starter cultures are prone to um, being consumed by something called bacteriophage, which means you can't use the same one every day. Because if you do, the bacteriophage will take home, you'll eat your starter culture, and you can't make cheese. So not only is it a longer process, a more complicated process, but you have to rotate it. So usually you have, you'll have a starter culture for Monday, one for Tuesday, one for Wednesday, and then you go back to Monday, you'll go back to the Monday one again, and you'll rotate it like that. Now, each one of those starter cultures will give you a completely different flavor. I remember um, a certain cheddar maker, people used to say it was, when's the best time to get this cheddar? And I think what they meant was spring, summer, autumn. And we would say, oh, Tuesdays, because that's when they use the best starter culture. That's how influential the starter culture was. You could actually tell what day it was made if you ate enough of it, just from the starter culture alone. So using traditional starter cultures, uh, binding in cloth, which is um, something that big producers don't do as well. They will vacuum pack, because if you bind in cloth, you will lose uh, moisture to the atmosphere that means your cheese is getting lighter but it also means that the paste is getting more concentrated in whiskey they call it they call it the angel's share the bit that evaporates off of the atmosphere well the angels can have that but what's left behind is more concentrated more interesting so if you're cloth binding you are losing sometimes up to five percent of the weight of a cheese and if you're talking about a cheese which is like 25 kilos and it's like 35 pounds a kilo retail price that's quite a lot of money evaporating off in the atmosphere yeah, that's why the big boys don't do it, because the margins are so fine. But for a cheese like this, it does make a difference. And actually, the bit around the edge tastes awesome. When I lived in America, I used to buy bits of Montgomery's cheddar. I used to go there every two weeks to Montgomery's to pick up cheese when I worked for Neil's Yard. And the, the taste of the rind tastes exactly like the smell of the maturing room at Montgomery's. It's like Proustian. Every time I ate it, I went from New York to, to a shed in Somerset. It's that distinct flavour, and the rind on this is delicious. Obviously, you can't eat the cloth, but actually, the rind tastes like the maturing one. It's delicious. I really like the bit under the rind. This isn't breaking the cheese down like this one. Like this is an this is an inactive rind. It's not breaking the cheese down, but it is giving character. To, it does give character to the cheese. I like it very much indeed. You might be able to see there's like fishes in it, holes. You can see how that's how the curds have knit together. So it's very different to say like a Gruyere or Comte or something from like the Alpine regions where they cook it, they make something much denser, much sweeter. This is actually quite, I'm actually going to just break a bit off. It's kind of primal, fat, look at that. So you can see, I mean, that's basically how the curds have knit together in the vat. You can see those curds, actually, the curd structure. So this cheese, being a farmhouse cheese, is going to be um, more delicate. It's going to be um, less aggressive. Randall Fonten had a, a Neil's yard had a, a phrase for it, which was a 10 mile cheese. You put it in your mouth, you eat it, you drive 10 miles, and you tell them going, mm, that's really nice. So it's about length of flavor. It's not about the amount of flavor. So I'm going to open this bottle of cider from Ross and Wine. So this is um, going to be bone dry. And traditionally in Somerset, you'd be looking at dry cider. It's usually still, this is bottle conditioned, so it's got some fizz, but that's fine. I thought I'd go for a fizzy one, just because most people do prefer fizzy. But this is a dry cider with tannin. This is a fatty cheddar. And actually the two things that, that with this, really what we're looking at is that fat and the tannin thing go together really well. Also the apple character of this. It's gonna be bone dry, but it will have intense apple character. I'm gonna pour it out. It's been in a whiskey barrel, um, but not for too long. Whiskey barrel sounds great. People say, oh, it's been in a whiskey barrel, fantastic. But actually the problem with putting things in whiskey barrels is, Sometimes all you'll taste is a whiskey barrel. If you put something delicious in a whiskey barrel and mask the thing that you put in, what was the point? So I think sometimes you can easily overdo these things. And it's sometimes it's like almost like Emperor's New Clothes. You know, if you put something in a bourbon barrel and all you taste is bourbon, you might as well have bought a bottle of bourbon. You mask it. If you've got something delicious, like a base product, like a really good cider, you don't want to mask it, you want to enhance it. And that's the deal. But Albert and Mike at Ross and Wine, 
been making uh, cider on this farm since the 1930s. They're very progressive, do a lot of single varieties. Most cider traditionally would have been blended. They do a lot of single variety stuff. They've almost got a library of single varieties. So you can actually go there and test what certain variety would be like. It will change with the vintage, it'll change with the season, but it gives you an idea what the individual cider apples can do and bring to the party. With blended cider, you couldn't do that. And traditionally, you, were, you always would have blended. I'm gonna try these two things. Let's put this in my mouth first. This isn't gonna to be too, too aggressive, this cheddar. It's quite moist, it's quite creamy. The Trithalans do make a creamier cheddar. It's about 14 months old. It's really creamy, actually. Buttery. There is a, a cooked milk sweetness to it. It's delicious, actually. It's got acidity. It's not overpowering. There's a sweetness in the background. There's a minerality as well. Melts in the mouth. I've let this warm up to room temperature, and it's benefited so much for it. It's absolutely, it's really good. It's not too strong, though. The number of people who've come up to me in the shop and said, I want the strongest cheddar you've got. And my response is, well, do you want the strongest or the nicest? And then they're confused because they assume the two things are synonymous. And in fact, they're not. This, this subtlety is a very hard thing to get right. It's, it's There's a fine line between bland and subtle. And a cheese like this is subtle for a cheddar, but it certainly isn't bland. It's got bags of flavor. I'm going to try with this. My mouth is now coated with fat from that. So I'm hoping the tannins in this will help offset that. Really subtle, <clears throat> excuse me, really subtle whiskey, just there on the edge of perception. So it's there, but it's not masking, it's enhancing, working really well. Delicate bubbles, they're dosed with five grams per liter to bring the sparkle in the bottle. So the dose of sugar, then bottle it, and then that sugar ferments and gives you a very delicate sparkle. And this is 6.5%. So the thing about cider is it's a lot less strong than wine, but if you're making it with proper cider apples, 6% is normally about where you're gonna to get to. It can get pretty big and it can hide its alcohol really well. So that's something to think about when you're drinking cider. You can quaff it quite fast without realizing quite how strong it is. These, I've got bottles that go up to 8.5. 8 that's the maximum you can get to in terms of taxation before you go into another tax bracket. So then get to 8.5, 5.5, particularly if they've been in whiskey barrels. This one is a, a measly 6.5, but still pretty hefty. Uh, really delicate, dry, lots of fruit character though. It is dry and it's got tannin, but it's got such good fruit in the middle that it offsets all of that. It's not like stuck in on a leather belt, which sometimes you can get with these really bold tannic ciders. It's balanced, it's interesting, it's delicious. It's actually quite light and refreshing. Um, and it works really well with the cider. So, so what we're talking about, we're talking about acidity, we're talking about um, sugar, we're talking about tannin with regards to ciders. With regards to cheese, we're talking about fats, salt and acidity, okay? So all these different things we, which work in combination, I've talked about, so sugar with um, sugar with salt, sugar with acidity, bubbles with fat, tannins with fats. These things all work together very, very well. And actually the classic Kleinman's lunch is an apple and some cheese, like a hunk of cheddar like that. It's something that just works together. I don't always stick with the what goes together, grows together thing. I'm not sure that always pans out, but I think in terms of apples and classic British cheeses like cheddar, it absolutely does. It works very, very well. So it works total sense that something like a cider would work with a lot of traditional British cheeses. So I've overrun, which I knew I would, but never mind. Last cheese. So this is not made by the Trithalans. It's a blue cheese, it's called Stitchelton. It's not Stilton because it's unpasteurized. All Stilton is now pasteurized. This is unpasteurized. So Joe couldn't call it Stilton. Stitchelton is a, 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 an old name for the town of Stilton from the Lincoln Rolls it's taken. Um, made by George Schneider, natural rind, um, made by hand, very creamy, not too blue. Look at the blueing on that. It's not too blue. Blue breaks down cheese, blue. Breaks down fats, proteins, gives you flavor, and it blows the acidity, and it makes it creamy as well. And that takes time, but you only need enough blue to do that. It's not really the blue itself you want to taste, it's the effects the blue has on the taste around it. So if you have too much blue, you'll only taste the blue, the Rock 40 penicillium, that's the name of the blue. It's very strong stuff. So if you have too much of it, that's all you're going to taste. I don't know if you can see inside the there. All these little holes, that's how you get the blue in. You don't inject it, you make a hole, the air goes in, and it wakes up the dormant blue mold. That's how you do it. It's, they're, they're aerobic molds, and if you don't pierce it, you'd have white stitchleton. Or if you're making a still, you'd have white stilton. 
white rock for or whatever blue cheese you happen to be making. So I'm cutting quite a large chunk of this. Totally handmade, which sounds like a gimmick. It's not the more gentle you are with the curds, the more moisture retains. This is creamy. It's been made for four to five months. So therefore the paste got, it's broken out, it's got creamy. You can start to get sweetness from it. The acidity has gone down. It starts to become much sweeter and almost malty in texture. I mean, I'm breaking that. It's, it's, it's sort of fudgy and moussey rather than, um, rather than acid, which a lot of Stiltons are because they're sold young. You can sell them as soon as they go blue, but you have to give the blue the time to make it creamy to get the full flavor. So I'm going to eat this. I'm going to open this. Excuse me. So ice cider originates from Canada and Scandinavia, where apples would freeze on the tree. So when you press them, the water would stay in the fruit in the form of ice. And what you get is a very, 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 very concentrated apple juice, which you would then ferment, which would basically give you a dessert wine. And that's what this is. In Somerset, in Borough Hill, Kingsbury Episcopi, where they make this, they freeze the juice on purpose because it doesn't get cold enough. I think sometimes they leave barrels in the orchards to freeze, but generally speaking, they will freeze the, they freeze the juice and then they will um, extract what isn't frozen and ferment it into this. Now the colour alone is worth the price of entry. Absolutely gorgeous stuff. If you like dessert wines, this is the thing to go for. If you like blue cheese and sweet wines, think Roquefort and Sauterne, for example. Classic pairing, salty blue cheese. Salt is an important ingredient in blue cheese. Usually 4% salt, approximately, which is saltier than other cheeses. So the sugar balances really well. I mean, that is salty, but it's balanced with the, balanced with the malty sweetness, um, which is fab. But this, in my opinion, is always a no-brainer. Sugar and salt, like blue cheese and dessert wine, works every time. So on the nose, it smells of really ripe fruit. There's an appleiness, but there's a floral nature to it as well. I mean, it smells like it's going, it's going to be sweet. You can't smell sweet. You can smell something and you think it's going to be sweet because it smells like honey. Then you can drink it and it'll be bone dry. But on this occasion, I haven't done it. It will be sweet, but it smells awesome. Mm. Holy moly. When this is over, I'm going to consume all of this, basically, for my tea. Um, that is a cracking, cracking pairing. Salty blue cheese, dessert wine. This also has acidity, though. And that means it's not just flabby and cloying. That the, the, the acidity balances the sugar amazingly. If you can get a bottle of this ice cider, or any ice cider, I recommend you do, and get a really good quality blue cheese. I mean, Stitchleton would be the way to go. I think it's like anything. Anything really would be uh, with a dessert wine. So I overran. I tried to go as fast as I could, but you know, still a V. Uh, so we had three cheeses. We had Gowin from the Chatham Brothers, and then a Pickpock from the Chatham Brothers. That's the cheddar, and Colson um, Stitchleton from the Chatham. I knew they said Colson Bassett. Stitchleton from the Chatham Brothers, which is part of their trio selection, their classic trio, which you can order online at the shop if you want it. And I think this is going to go online. So you can always um, watch this later and taste along if you want to. And also these ciders, uh, my website, corkandcrown.co.uk. You can buy those on there as well and taste along as well. Um, and also, I think if you buy your cheese before the end of the, the weekend and put in Big Cheese 10, capital letters, you get 10% off everything at Brothers.com. So there you go. That was a very, 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 very quick tour. Not quick enough, but quick tour of three very interesting apple based drinks, ciders if you like, and three classic British cheeses. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Chris. That was that was very insightful. I'm definitely gonna get some of that ice cider. That that tastes, that sounds amazing. Very, very nice, it really is. And I've got so, all of this to drink now. So it's, uh, you know, what can you do? We'll, we'll leave it there because we run over time. Um, yeah. If anybody wants to hot foot it back onto the Big Cheese Weekend the website and, um, You'll be able to catch uh, Owen with a nightcap or two from Teak House. Okay. Thank you very much. Have My pleasure. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.